going to follow <coughs> a theme through our three readings for, for the day. I asked for two of them to be read. So that's 2nd of Kings 21, Ezekiel 11, and Luke 7. And you'll see what I mean as we go through. And we'll take our exhortation and encouragement from that. And it will lead us from some very dark days in Old Testament times through ultimately to the resurrection. So we'll, we'll go through, and you, I say this advisedly, we go through a veil of tears, and you'll see what I mean in a moment. <coughs> Second of Kings 21, then, uh, we've just finished our readings about Hezekiah, which was a high point, wasn't it, in uh, the worsening um, conditions during the history of the Kingdom of Judah, and we're now on the down again with Manasseh. And Second uh, uh, Kings 21 um, makes depressing reading. Just think what Hezekiah had done, how he'd saved the people. He had, through opening the house of the Lord and cleansing it and reinstating worship, he had reunified the nation. He brought the people from the northern tribes together to the great uh, um, Passover that was celebrated in, uh, in uh, 2 Chronicles 31. And he had rededicated to the people, to God. He had um, brought in a period of relative peace when the enemies of the nation, the Assyrians, had been defeated. So what a pity it was that Manasseh, who had been born during that last 15 years of Hezekiah's life, he was only 12 years old when he began to reign, took the nation on a downward spiral that was to lead to the very conditions that we see in Ezekiel's 11th chapter uh, in a moment. So just very briefly in 2 Kings 21, just look at uh, verse 2. Manasseh did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. He built again the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed. He reared up altars for Baal, made a grove as did Ahab king of Israel, worshipped all the hosts of heavens and heaven and served them, built altars in the house of the Lord, in which the Lord said, In Jerusalem will I put my name. Um, and he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he made his, fa uh, his son pass through the fire and observe times and used enchantments and so on. So you couldn't think of a worse catalogue, could you? He'd, he'd comprehensively reversed the reforms of Hezekiah and he'd gone even further. He brought the worst of the teachings of Ahab and Jezebel. He did what Ahaz, uh, uh, Hezekiah's father, had done, and they, which was defile the house of the Lord and to use it for false worship. It was so depressing, wasn't it? Just, just makes you wonder what the faithful in Jerusalem thought of this evil king. So it was comprehensive degradation of the temple. And yet, as we shall see from Ezekiel, the glory of the Lord was still there. God was still dwelling among his people, even though uh, they had done so wickedly. And so, in verse 12 of uh, 2 Kings 21, <coughs> one of the prophets of God came, um, we'll uh, go to verse 11 for connection, because Manasseh, king of Judah, hath done these abominations, and hath done wickedly above all that the Amorites did, which were before him, and hath made Judah also to sin with his idols, therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such an evil upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whosoever heareth of it, both his ears shall tingle. And you know where that phrase comes from, don't you? Remember back in Samuel that was what Samuel was told in the temple of the wickedness <coughs> of the priest Eli, that God would bring against Israel something uh, uh, for which both the ears would tingle. And verse 13, I will stretch over Jerusalem 
the line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab. I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipe up a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. So, very graphic description. First of all, the plumb line that God had held up against the house of Ahab in Samaria was to be held against Manasseh and his house. <coughs> and we know what that plumb line had resulted in. It's the destruction of Ahab and his wicked wife Jezebel and the ultimate destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel. And then they were to be wiped as a dish and turned upside down to make sure there was nothing left in it. How sad that was. Now come to Ezekiel chapter um, 11 and you'll see this theme continue but the wonderful thing about Ezekiel chapter 11 is that there is a dawn and brightness coming through in this chapter. <coughs> First thing to notice if you look at the end of the chapter um, verse 24 and verse 24 so the vision that I had seen went up from me then I spake unto them of the captivity all the things that the Lord had showed me what you realise from that little phraseology there is that uh, chapter 11 ends the introductory section of the book of the prophet Isaiah and you remember how it all begins with the manifestation of the cherubim of God and we see them again in chapter 10 and we have them mentioned here in chapter 11 as well we'll look at that in a moment so this whole beginning of <coughs> Ezekiel's prophecy is this 11, chap 11 chapters and we're just looking at the end of that in this 11th chapter and it, uh, he tells it to the people of their captivity so there is um, Ezekiel in captivity, the Jehoiakim's captivity, so we're looking at the 590s BC now, when there was still a kingdom of Judah, when there was still temple worship in Jerusalem, uh, and when, however, the Babylonian threat was looming larger and larger. They'd already taken captives, including Ezekiel, off to Babylon, and we're told, chapter 1, that he was by the river Kibar, which is one of the tributaries of the Euphrates, sort of northwest of Babylon itself. And here, faithful Ezekiel receives this vision. I just want, we'll come back to chapter 11, but just go back to chapter 8, if you would, to see what it is that Ezekiel sees. And what we find in chapters 8 onwards is a vision of what is going on in the temple in Jerusalem. So that rather picks up from what we were seeing in Manasseh's day, of course, we're now 100 or so years later. But here, in chapter 8, what does Ezekiel see? What he, what he, it's almost like a video, to be honest. This is with his described a vision. And he's able, as it were, from this standpoint in Babylonian, uh, Babylonia, to zoom in through the walls of the temple, through the outer court, into what's going on in the temple itself. And what he sees going on in the temple very much the same kinds of things that Manasseh introduced that little time before. And what a sad thing it is that these things were continuing. So, for example, chapter 8 and uh, verse 6, uh, the angel says to um, Ezekiel in this vision, Son of man, seest thou what they do, even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here that they should go far off from my sanctuary but turn thee yet again and thou shalt see greater abominations so what he's saying is look into the sanctuary they're doing things that are not worthy of my sanctuary and they'll be taken away from it so verse 7 he brought me to the door of the court and when I looked behold a hole in the wall Son of man, dig now in the wall. When I had digged in the wall, behold a door. So he's, as it were, in this dream, he's going through and digging a hole in the wall and he's seeing through into the sanctuary. And what does he see when he sees that door? He goes in, verse 9, and beholds the wicked abominations there. And so I went in and saw, verse 10, behold every form of creeping things and abominable beasts, all the idols of the house of Israel, portrayed upon the walls round about. So just as Manasseh previously had defiled the temple, so they'd comprehensively 
degraded this place of national worship for the nation and they'd introduced all sorts of other religions in their wall paintings and so on. There stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel so all the leaders of the, of the country in the midst of them stood Jeazaniah the son of Shaphan with every man his censer in his hand a thick cloud of censer went up and so on. Wasn't this horrible then that Ezekiel there in captivity <coughs> may be thinking well at least some of my brothers and sisters some of my, um, some of my countrymen and women are back there in Judah and they've got an opportunity to turn to the Lord and so on and what were they doing it was so depressing they had not heeded the judgments of God they were adding insult to his injury so much so verse 13 he, he said to me turn thee yet again thou shalt see greater abominations that they do then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house which was towards the north and behold there sat women weeping for Tammuz Tammuz you probably know an old um, Sumerian um, god or uh, in uh, Assyrian it was uh, Dumuzi and they were worshipped this was in effect god of the summer a fertility god and when it got to the autumn all this religious ceremony they wept for Tammuz the sun went in the winter, the winter came the crops were in and they wept for Tammuz and it was a sort of almost an animistic um, religion wasn't it certainly nothing to do with the God of creation the true God of Israel and what a sad perversion that was come with me to chapter 11 what was the result of this verse 21 as for them whose heart walketh after the heart of their detestable things and their own abominations I will recompense their way upon their own heads saith the Lord what was God do we're told in verse 22 then did the cherubims lift up their wings the wheels beside them and the glory of the God of Israel was over them above and the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain which is on the east side of the city and so this was the moment at which God left the city now this was a vision so it's a prophecy remember this, this was going on in the 590s BC by 586 BC perhaps about 10 years later God's glory departed from Israel and Judah from Jerusalem and why was it? it was because they didn't heed the good word of God the word of his prophets those in Jerusalem those in Babylon remember we know from the book of the prophet Jeremiah that letters were sent between Jeremiah and Babylon and back again so all these messages were going to them and they were not heeding it and so that great wonderful vision of the cherubim that you get in chapter 1 and chapter 10 the cherubim then lift up and go God leaves his people and do you remember what happened in the story of uh, Samuel and Eli remember the tingling ears that we saw before why of course when Eli allowed the ark of God to go into battle against the Philistines and it got captured and Hophni and Phinehas were taken and so on that the daughter-in-law of Eli has a son and she calls his name Ichabod the glory is departed from Israel so there's some lovely parallels there that I'm not going to follow any more but you can see them there that they had as it were in type in the days of Eli something they should have learned from and here they were in Ezekiel's day history was repeating itself big time very sadly they had spent years um, perverting uh, the ways of God they had comprehensively degraded and defiled the temple and the, uh, the worship of the true God of Israel and in 586 BC he abandoned them ok that's the end of the first part the second part I told you that in Ezekiel 11 there is hope and I've entitled 
uh, second part then, a little sanctuary, because do you remember when we had this uh, read together, there was that um, teaching about sanctuary. So then, God had told them that they'd defiled his sanctuary, but he promised them another sanctuary. And this sanctuary wasn't a temple in Jerusalem, not at that time at least. Just look with me at chapter 11 of Ezekiel and verse 16. Therefore say, Thus saith the Lord God, although I have cast them far off among the heathen, that was the natural consequence of God withdrawing his glory from Jerusalem, they would be scattered. Although I have scattered them among the countries, yet will I be to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they shall come. And as the modern version that was read earlier said, a sanctuary for a little time. I don't think it matters which for our purposes this morning. The point is that God would be a sanctuary for them in the countries where they were scattered. And the first thing you will recognise from that is of course that this sanctuary can't be a building. Uh, these Jews were sent around the world, they were scattered, uh, they were not settled, they were uh, uh, constantly moved through the ages of history, and yet God was available to them as a sanctuary. Therefore, verse seven, 17 say, Thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. And verse 18, they would take away all the detestable things and all the abominations, so they would reform themselves, and that was a great and a good thing. And verse 19, I will give them one heart, put a new spirit within you, take away the stony heart out of their flesh, give them heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes, keep my ordinances and do them, they shall be my people and I will be their God. And that goes right back to the covenant God had made with them originally in Exodus 29 and Ezekiel uh, and Leviticus 26. I, uh, you will be my people and I will be my God if only, if only you will worship me properly and if you will keep my ordinances and my statutes. And here is a promise right in these dark days in Ezekiel in the depths of despair, there is to be a little sanctuary for those people from Judah and Israel who turned again to God in the countries where they had been scattered. And um, it's quite interesting, you don't get that phraseology very often where the sanctuary is something other uh, than a, a building. Um, but there's an interesting one, there's no need to turn to this in Isaiah um, chapter 8, which you, you're very familiar with, because this interestingly comes from the days of Hezekiah, and it talks about, uh, <coughs> he shall be for a sanctuary, this is Isaiah 14, but for a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offence to both the houses of Israel. And this stone and a sanctuary, as you very well know, is picked up in the New Testament uh, to refer to the Lord Jesus Christ, both in the Gospels and in Peter's first epistle. Uh, but we're also told that this person is not just a stone of stumbling, but also a sanctuary, a foundation stone, uh, an individual who could be the centre of their worship. Of course, that fits very well with what we know about the Lord Jesus Christ. Initially, it refers to Hezekiah. But there you have that idea that uh, there could be a little sanctuary that was not a building, but was a person, the Lord Jesus Christ, or the Lord God himself, in the countries where the Israelites were scattered, which is a lovely thought. Now then, um, what do we find in our New Testament reading? I said we'd link all three readings, and that we will do, so we go to Luke 7 now. Just bear in mind what we've seen. We've seen, then, uh, degradation of the sanctuary, false worship. We've seen weeping for Tammuz, 
as a false worship practice and we have seen the possibility of a little sanctuary sanctuary which is uh, through access to the Lord God in the countries where they were scattered now then let's bring some themes together in Luke chapter 7 what do we find in Luke chapter 7? Well, one thing you'll have noticed in Luke 7 is that although it begins in Galilee, it ends in uh, Jerusalem and Judea. Um, and although in, in Luke's Gospel, from chapter 9 onwards, you get that spiritual journey to Jerusalem, don't you? That Jesus resolved to go to Jerusalem, almost as if all the previous bit in Luke had been in Galilee. Of course, it's not the case. We're going to look at the... Uh, uh, the woman and the alabaster box of ointment in a moment which takes place in Judea, possibly in Jerusalem. So, uh, we've, um, Luke chapter 7 covers a number of things. But uh, early on in the chapter we have the widow of Nain. That starts in verse 11. And Jesus um, carried out this great miracle. What does he say to the widow of Nain? Verse 13, when the Lord saw her, son had died, coffin was being carried out, he had compassion on her and said unto her, weep not. So, unlike the uh, women weeping for Tammuz falsely to a, to a false <coughs> god, here Jesus said there is no cause for weeping. Why? Because Jesus was going to raise the dead came and touched the bier, and they that bare him stood still, and he said, Young man, I say unto thee, arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. Isn't that wonderful, therefore, that Jesus coming, showing, of course, looking forward to his own resurrection and the future resurrection of the faithful, he shows the powers of the age to come, and the cause for weeping has gone. What a contrast, therefore, with the the sad and dark times that we were looking at in Ezekiel's prophecy. You'll realise I called this last part of my exhortation weep not for that reason, as we shall see. And so um, we have a resurrection carried out. Then if you carry on down later in the chapter, verse 36, Jesus is by this time in Jerusalem, or possibly in Bethany. It's not quite clear, but he's some, somewhere in the environs of Jerusalem. We'll just talk about that in a moment. So, one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house. Now, this man, verse 40, is called Simon. So, Simon the Pharisee. He may very well be the same person, as Simon the leper uh, that we find uh, in the other Gospels. Um, and uh, we know that this must have been around Jerusalem because the woman uh, that comes to Jesus to anoint him is described, verse 37,